Thank you. Goedemiddag, ik open deze academische plechtigheid met gebed. Spiritus Sancti Gratia Illuminet Sensus et Corda Nostra. Gaat u zitten. Welkom bij de oratie van professor Floris de Lange. Fijn dat zoveel mensen naar Nijmegen zijn gekomen. Ik wil een kort inleidend woord spreken over onze nieuwe collega. Professor De Lange heeft mij verteld dat hij een soort eeuwige student is geweest. Hij studeerde chemische technologie in Twente, maar dat deed hij niet zo lang. En daarna bekwaamde hij zich in de neuropsychologie en in de artificiële intelligentie. Hier in Nijmegen. De kiem voor zijn belangstelling voor de cognitieve neurowetenschap is gewekt in een onderzoekstage in Gent... Uh, bij professor Guy Vingerhoets, die hier vandaag ook aanwezig is. Uh, professor De Lange studeerde af in 2002 en van 2003 tot 2007 verrichtte hij promotieonderzoek aan het Donders Instituut hier in Nijmegen. En na een postdoc periode in Parijs keerde hij in 2009 terug naar het Donders Instituut waar hij sinds 2013 PI Principal Investigator is. Hij is lid van de Jonge Academie van de KNW en heeft meerdere aansprekende prijzen en subsidies verworven. Professor De Lange heeft de leeropdracht Predictive Perception and Cognition. En dat hij aan een internationaal georiënteerde universiteit werkt, blijkt uit het feit dat deze aankondiging in het Nederlands is. De oratie van collega De Lange, net als diens leeropdracht in het Engels is, en dat deze oratie een Franse titel heeft, Ceci n'est pas Net pas un piep. Wat het dan wel is, want dat gaan we dan straks horen, denk ik. Uh, professor De Lange, uh, graag verleen ik u bij deze het woord. Director, colleagues, family and friends. Ceci n'est pas un piep. This is not a pipe. As many of you will know, this is provocative painting is painted by the well-known Belgian surrealist painter René Magritte. But why is this the title of my lecture? I should say that for a brief moment I considered an alternative title, the one you see here. But in the end I thought this might be unwise in case the university would take my title seriously. So I'm going to stick with the pipe. So why, why is this not a pipe? When I first saw this painting many years ago, I thought this painting was a simple joke, a provocation. Of course this is a pipe, clearly. But Magritte was not joking. As he puts it himself, the famous pipe how people reproached me for it. And yet, could you stuff my pipe? No, it's just a representation, is it not? So if I had written on my picture, this is a pipe, I would have been lying. So we are looking at a visual representation of a pipe, not an actual pipe. That may sound like a silly philosophical game to you. Why is this important? But just like my Greek painting is a representation, our brain also creates internal representations of things in the outside world. And just as images can betray, our internal representations are also distorted by everything we know, believe, like, and fear. Let me give you a concrete example. Here we are all looking at the same image, but we do not all have the same percept. I can clearly see my daughter having a drink. But many of you probably just see a collection of black and white spots. Now, I'm going to provide you with one perceptual experience, this one. And this may transform your perception of the earlier image. What this shows 
to my mind, is that perception is something you have to learn. And it is transformed by all the experiences that you've built up over your lifetime. Today, I would like to share with you some recent insights into how this process works, focusing on contributions from my lab over the past 10 years. Let me start out by explaining to you how perception is roughly implemented in the brain. Here you can see your brain. Now, what happens when an image appears in front of our eyes? Let's say of my daughter, Sophie. Well, first, the light reflected by the picture hits the light-sensitive layer at the back of the eyes, called the retina, and it gets transformed into an electrical signal. From there, this signal travels through the thalamus and arrives at the back of the head, where the first cortical area resides that processes visual information, hence called V1, the primary visual cortex. Now, this area, colored red here, analyzes the image in terms of simple features, like oriented edges. And from there, the signal spreads through a set of ever more specialized regions that can analyze more and more complex features. And when the signal activates these neurons, you, as an observer, become aware of the fact that you are looking at Sophie. This is roughly the textbook version of how perception works. But it is not clear how such a brain would be able to perceive images like the ones that I showed you a few slides ago. This image was incomprehensible to you before, but now it has become meaningful. Critically, the input hasn't changed. It's exactly the same image. The only thing that has changed is that you now have a memory of the intact picture of my daughter in a costume. And that memory helps you to interpret the input. Now, the previous example may seem a bit contrived, but it is actually not so uncommon in the real world. In fact, we are so good at interpreting the visual world that we sometimes see things that aren't really there, a psychological phenomenon called pareidolia. And this is illustrated by the image here on the left, which is part of a Cydonia region on Mars. When this image was taken by the Viking orbiter in 1976, some people asserted that this was evidence of a long-lost Martian civilization due to the presence of this remarkable face sculpture. What it is rather evidence of, though, is the fact that we have a really strong bias towards human faces. Human faces are a very relevant category of visual stimuli for us, and therefore we may look at the world through what you could call a face lens, testing the hypothesis that something is a face. This idea is further corroborated by the set of images here on the right, where you can see faces emerge from a loudspeaker, wall sockets, a cup of coffee, a water tap, a mailbox, and a washing machine. Now, these images are entertaining, but they are also quite instructive, I think. They tell us something about the priors or the expectations that we carry with us while we are trying to understand the visual world around us. One final example from a painting of the Italian painter Giuseppe Arcimboldo, painted in the 16th century. This, member, this painting shows a member of the legal profession, a lawyer. And at first sight, there doesn't seem to be anything conspicuous with this painting. It just looks like a classical portrait. But when I enlarge this painting, you become aware of the fact that this lawyer consists of parts of fish and chicken, and his body is composed of legal documents. One thing you can learn from this picture is that Giuseppe Arcimboldo probably was not a big fan of lawyers. But I think there is an even more important lesson here, which is that we first see the bigger picture, in this case this entire portrait, and this constrains how we interpret the individual elements of the scene. We expect a chin or a beard at the bottom of a face, not a fishtail. That expectation can sometimes be so strong that it can render us blind to the actual input. How is it possible that our perception can be so biased by prior beliefs? I think this naturally follows from what I will call the predictive brain hypothesis. I would like to briefly explain this hypothesis using the example of the lawyer painting. On the left, we can see our lawyer again, and on the right, our brain. Now, one can define several levels of description in this painting, all of which are also represented in our brain. 
For example, the lawyer has a face and the brain has dedicated neurons that respond to faces. At a smaller scale, this face is composed of several parts, like a nose, mouth, and ears. And again, there are neurons that represent these slightly less complex features. And when one would zoom in all the way on this painting, you can see that it is composed of many small little lines and edges. And this is exactly what this very first part of the visual brain, called V1, is activated by. Here again, color-coded in red. Now, interestingly, all these areas are constantly talking to each other. And thereby, more complex neurons, like face neurons, could potentially help the simpler neurons to make sense of their input by providing their expectations of what the simpler neurons should be seeing. For example, a face neuron might be telling the relevant nose and mouth neurons that they are expected to be active too. And this could happen by means of feedback from higher to lower order areas. And it could explain why we don't notice the fishtail when the input is not very strong, as was the case with this small painting. When the input is strong, however, and clashes with our expectations, a prediction error will be sent forward, as shown by the red arrows, forcing the system to update its expectations. Now, there are two critical ingredients of a predictive brain that I described in the previous slide. The first ingredient is a predictive model. This is, in essence, a model that says, if there would be a face, this would be the expected pattern of activity. This is also called a generative model, as it generates predictions about what we are looking at. In the case of this painting, <coughs> the overall structure of the painting generates a strong prediction that there is a person with a goatee, a small beard, which is how many people perceive the painting when they shortly look at it. These predictions may be neurally implemented by the feedback projections. Predictions can be wrong, of course. Therefore, the second ingredient is a mechanism to update the model on the basis of how surprising the input is. When there is a clear mismatch between what we predict and what the input is, such as when we clearly see a fishtail, feed-forward projections update these predictions and generate a new hypothesis about what we're looking at. In this case, the hypothesis that we're looking at, the fishtail. Now, this is, in a nutshell, one of the main hypotheses that I am studying with my lab. And in the next 15 minutes, I would like to give you some examples of progress that we have made testing it. Now, for starters, these ingredients may sound a bit abstract. <clears throat> so to make these concepts more concrete, I am going to ask you all to use your own generative model for a moment. Try to answer the question that you can see there, the following question for yourself. How many windows are there in your bedroom? I will give you a moment to determine the answer for yourself. <laughs> now, you can tell me the answer after my talk. It's not uh, essential for this talk. The answer is not so interesting, probably, unless you perhaps don't have any windows in your bedroom. But what is interesting is how you got to this uh, answer. You probably did not know the answer immediately. You couldn't just look it up somewhere. Rather, what you probably did is to imagine yourself in your bedroom, imagine looking at the windows and count them. But what were you looking at? At a mental image of the bedroom, a mental image of your windows. This is what I mean with a generative model, a model that can generate visual experiences in the absence of actual visual experience. But is that also what happens in the brain? Is there image-specific activity in the visual cortex, for example, that resembles the activity elicited by the image when we actually have it in front of our eyes? This is something that Anke Marit Albers, a former PhD student in my lab, sought to find out in collaboration with Ivan Toni. She asked individuals not to count windows in their house, but something a bit simpler and more experimentally tractable namely to imagine a simple line stimulus. She then looked at the patterns of brain activity in those participants, and particularly in the red area uh, in, this, in the part of the brain that is called V1. This is a visual region that is activated by line stimuli, 
and different orientations of the line stimulus will activate slightly different parts of the region. That's why we can read out, as researchers, from looking at the brain activity patterns in this area, what the orientation is of a stimulus that a participant is looking at. Remarkably, we could also read out which stimulus people were imagining, again by looking at the patterns of activity in this area. And these activity patterns were highly similar to those elicited by actual perception. In the graph on the right top, you can see at time point zero that participants started imagining a particular stimulus. And after a few seconds, a computer algorithm could guess well above chance what the stimulus was that the participants were imagining on the basis of the brain activity in the visual cortex. This was quite remarkable because it means that a part of the brain that is traditionally associated with transforming the input from our eyes into percepts is also engaged by mere thought. And it means that we can actually create a sensory experience just by thinking about it. Now this research generated a fair amount of media attention, for example within the Netherlands by the Volkskrant and the Telegraaf. And this was partly because the media recognized that this may have potential for the ability to read people's minds on the basis of brain scans. It's important to bear in mind though that these are individuals that choose to imagine a particular image for a rather long period of time. Therefore, I don't think there is a need to worry quite yet. Our rich inner world cannot be read out yet by an MRI scanner. There is something mysterious though about the data that I just presented you. Namely, even though there may be a remarkable neural similarity between perceiving something and just imagining it, Obviously, the two are not the same thing. We typically know when we are imagining things. No one here actually thought that they were in their house when they were mentally counting windows. At least, I hope not. This separation between internal thought and external reality is critical, and a failure to separate them leads to the well-known phenomenon of visual or auditory hallucinations, where one's inner speech or thoughts are perceived as having an external source. How does a healthy brain separate the internal from the external? Or put differently, why are we not hallucinating all the time? In a set of follow-up studies, we aim to find this out. And this was research done mainly by Sam Lawrence, Peter Koch, and a collaboration with David Norris's group. And we again asked individuals to imagine these line stimuli. But this time, we zoomed in a bit further on this early visual area of the brain that we have looked at before. And when we look in more detail, uh, we can see that this area consists of several layers, which for simplicity, I will divide in three, the deep, the middle, and the superficial. Now, what happens when this individual is imagining a line stimulus? As you can see, this leads to activity in the deep and the superficial layers of the primary visual cortex, while the middle layer is relatively silent. And this is in contrast to when this participant is actually looking at the same stimulus. So when the participant is actually looking at the stimulus, now there is activity in all layers, and in this case, the largest activity is even observed in the middle layer, as again can be seen in the upper right graph. Now, this separation of thought and reality into different layers of the same area fits well with what we know from neuroanatomy. Namely, input from the eyes travels to the visual cortex and, uh, to, and arrives in the middle layer. Top-down information embodying our thoughts, on the other hand, avoids this layer and targets the deep and the superficial layers. This technological advancement of layer-resolved fMRI may, I believe, really open up new possibilities for studying the human brain. And I anticipate that this will become an increasingly important tool in the years to come, as it can potentially shed light on the question of how a region is activated, rather than just whether it is activated. And this is why some people call this a move from 2D to 3D cognition. It really opens up a new dimension in neuroimaging Imaging layers is, however, not an easy task. Layers are incredibly thin. Each of the colored compartments that I talked about before 
has about the thickness of a credit card, about 0.8 millimeters. To be able to spatially resolve such small activity, we perhaps, ironically, need an extremely big machine. And in our case, this machine is located in Germany, a two-hour drive away, and it is impressive. But the most impressive machinery to be able to study this is the combined efforts of many human machines. And I think this is a great example of research that can only work if scientists generously collaborate. And this generosity of researchers, the willingness to share knowledge, skills and code, creates a situation where everyone benefits and where science can be really impactful. So far, I have shown you one critical ingredient of a predictive brain, the predictive model, which can generate a visual representation of what we expect to see. But these predictions are, of course, not always correct. And when they are not, they need to be updated. The second ingredient of a predictive brain is therefore this updating of our predictions, based on how large the discrepancy is between what we thought, the prediction, and the actual input. Now, when something is different from expected, different than expected, this often leads to a strong brain reaction. Surprise activates the brain, one could say. And I think this is probably one of the most important ingredients of humor and cartoons. For example, let us take a look at this cartoon. <laughs> now, depending on your taste, you may find this a uh, horrendous or very funny cartoon. I personally think it's very funny. And I think it is funny because it violates our expectations in so many ways. So one isn't supposed to laugh about horrible events, of course. Cats are not supposed to laugh at all. And cats are supposed <laughs> to be cute, not psychopaths. So in that, this cartoon won the popular vote of best cartoon of Icelandic black humor. Black humor <laughs> that is as dark as Icelandic winters. And I think it is the strong violation of our beliefs, our norms, and our world model that makes this such a funny cartoon. Experiments in my lab are usually a lot less funny, unfortunately. But to give you a flavor of how we can make images expected or surprising, I would like to once again engage you in a little experiment. You will see a series of images, all paintings by Magritte, and you simply have to clap when you see the image of a rubber ducky. This one. <laughs> okay, some people are very awake. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if everyone is ready, the experiment will now start. Excellent. Now, Judging from this sound, you are all excellent ducky detectors. You have all found the ducky at the end of the stream. If you have not clapped, you are not allowed to participate in any of my experiments, just as a claim. Yeah. But the ducky was actually not the important part of the demonstration. The important part was, was that there was a predictable structure in the sequence of images. The eye was followed by the pipe. <coughs> the pipe was followed by the cat and the cat was followed again by the eye. This makes all of these images expected. Upon seeing the eye, you can predict that the next image is going to be a pipe, etc. But you probably did not notice this. Interestingly, people often still don't notice this, even when they are subjected to these kind of regularities for a very long time. It's something that is surprisingly hard to become aware of. But that does not mean that our brain is not aware of it. In the past five years, many researchers in my lab have found numerous times that there is a reduced response in the brain when a sensation is expected. For example, in this area that I already talked about a lot, uh, V1, in response to predictable line stimuli, but also in the auditory cortex in response to an expected tone, in motion-sensitive cortex after expected motion, and in object selective brain regions after a predictable object stimulus. Now, all of this appears to happen mostly without as much noticing it. If we are really asked to pay attention to it, then of course we can figure out what is surprising and what is expected. 
And then one can often also see extra activity in other parts of the brain that are related to cognitive demands. But we don't seem to require awareness of or attention to the regularities in our world in order for them to modulate sensory processing. Now, what does that mean? What does this reduced activity for expected events actually reflect? The current hypothesis of my lab is that the brain automatically tries to extract regularities from the environment and to use this knowledge to filter our perception. This filtering process could serve several functions, depending on the situation. It can suppress things that are expected and not so important, but it can also enhance details that are important. So let's look at a few possible scenarios. So in one of my future avenues of research, I'm going to uh, research how expectations guide visual search. And to make this more concrete, again, a little task for you. Let's try to find the green sailing boat with red sails in this very busy scene. Now, while you are doing this, my guess is that you have probably filtered out the yellow beach and focused your search on the upper part. Where, uh, where the sea is, and trying, yeah, trying to find something red and green over there. And that is generally a good idea, and it helps you to find almost all of the boats in this scene, quite quickly. But of course, expectations can also mislead you when encountering a less probable situation. For example, in this case, I actually hit the boat in question over here on the beach, which is why most of you probably did not find it. <coughs> In the coming years, Florce and Ilke will be examining how exactly prior knowledge can both help and hurt our ability to quickly find things in the world. And one of the hypotheses is that expectations, while generally a good thing, can also be quite harmful when searching an environment, because our expectations can render us blind to the unexpected details, the small elements in a scene that we may actually be looking for. <coughs> And this is something that is well known to Hans Aarsman, a former photographer whom some of you may know from his columns in the Volkskant. Since 20 years, he does not longer make pictures himself, but he rather analyzes images in the news for the surprising little details that convey the story often. And this is one of the images that he analyzed in the Volkskant earlier this year, showing uh, a scene of sheep that are walking in the outskirts of Paris. Quite a surprising sight in itself. By scrutinizing the image in minute detail, he discovers things that we usually don't notice. For example, the pedestrians that are making pictures uh, of the sheep with their smartphones, or the whistling shepherds whose shoelaces are untied. And to see all of these details, he stares at these images with suspicion, questioning the beliefs that are automatically evoked by him and spending hours of looking at an image to uncover all of the hidden and often intriguing details. Then again, even people whose job it is to carefully scrutinize images can miss out on things in a visual image when it doesn't conform with what they're expecting or what they are looking for. In this study, the authors asked expert radiologists to examine this CT scan of the lungs for nodules. Unbeknownst to the radiologists, the authors hid an image of a gorilla in the CT scan. If you have not yet seen the gorilla, let me reveal it for you. There is the gorilla. Uh, surprisingly, it turned out that 83% of the radiologists did not see this gorilla, even though they were carefully looking at this image, uh, scrutinizing it, but scrutinizing it for a different purpose. So, expectations may sometimes prevent us from seeing something. They can also be quite helpful, though. When the input is very weak, they can help to make sense of a noisy input signal. An example of this can be seen in this illustration. Most people perceive this as a foggy street scene composed of a building, a car parked by the side of the road. Let me point it out for you. So, let's see. Yeah, so there would be a car over here and a pedestrian crossing the street. Interestingly, however, there is no pedestrian and there is no car. At least there is nothing that differentiates these two objects 
except for a 90 degree rotation. They are actually the same objects. And in this case, your expectations are helping you to automatically interpret the objects in the light of the expectations derived from the scene. A final example. In the beginning of my talk, I explained that we may have what you could call a face filter or a face lens because faces are so important for us, which leads us to see faces in all kinds of objects. Language may also change how we view the world. And Jolien Franke, a former graduate student in, that was supervised by both myself and Peter Haggard, called this viewing the world through language tinted glasses. And what she showed in her thesis is that things that we are looking at, things that we perceive, may automatically activate their verbal semantic label, which often makes it easier to quickly decide what we're seeing. And this phenomenon is quite beautifully illustrated by the drawing by Swedish artist Thomas Broom, <coughs> where each object is drawn with the letters that form the object. Now, can this filter be broken? A recent theory of autism has suggested that filtering of perception by our expectations may be reduced or even absent in individuals suffering from autism. This may explain their hypersensitivity to sounds and lights, especially when they are sudden and unpredictable. Christian Utsrat, in collaboration with Jan Buitelaar, examined this theory by presenting predictable and unpredictable inputs to individuals who either did or did not have autism, using the paradigm that I explained before. Specifically, he paired particular images such that upon seeing the first, individuals could predict the second image. And Chris indeed found some support for the hypothesis that there is reduced filtering in autism. Whereas there was reduced activity in the primary visual cortex of healthy individuals for expected input, this pattern was not observed in the patients with autism. And this could be an important mechanism of sensory disturbances in autism. And I think it requires follow-up. And this reduced sensory filter in autism, more generally, may generate visual experiences that are qualitatively quite different from our experience. And this is illustrated by this beautiful painting where we see the world through the eyes of David Barth, a 10-year-old boy with autism, who is also incredibly gifted at drawing. And the attention to detail and reduced constraint by the global scene are immediately apparent in this intriguing painting. More generally, this genre is called outsider art, or art brut, art by self-taught or naive art makers. And I think it can provide a powerful window into the experience of people who have different mental states than most of us. For example, people suffering from psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia. <coughs> now, from time to time, I get asked the questions what I'm doing this research for. Why should we care about this research? Who is to benefit from it? And I think there are many possible answers to this question. One answer could be to say that by understanding how the brain works, we can hopefully also understand its malfunctioning in neurological and psychiatric conditions. This is illustrated by the research on autism that I just explained. Another potential benefactor could be the classroom. By understanding how the brain filters information, we can potentially invent ways to make information more salient and thereby promote learning. Finally, there has been a revolution in the field of artificial intelligence, with computers obviously becoming ever more smarter. Nevertheless, robots are still quite far from showing human intelligence. Understanding how intelligence is implemented in our neural machinery has already given a big boost to improving AI, and I anticipate that it will continue to do so in the coming decades. Although all of these answers are correct and valuable, I am nevertheless going to cross them out for the moment. And the reason for that is that I think these answers overlook, or worse, don't take seriously, the most important benefactor of research into the human brain. Now, what is that then? The most important benefactor, to my mind, is simply all of us. 
We as a species care about research. We are fundamentally curious about ourselves and the world around us. And trying to understand ourselves and the world in which we live is, I think, an important part of our culture. For example, the society is interested in the origins, the origins of the universe, even though finding this out does not lead to a spin-off company. The society is also curious about how the human brain works. And I am, of course, tremendously happy that we live in a world filled with such curiosity, where many people want to inform themselves and know how the world works. And this is something that I think the society knows quite well, but scientists sometimes forget in a research climate where the need to apply our research is ever more stressed. And this hunger for knowledge in the general population is well illustrated by a, a wonderful film festival that is held every year in this city, In Science International Science Film Festival. And only a few weeks ago, more than 8,000 people visited this festival to satisfy their scientific curiosity. Last year, I was lucky to meet Marlene van der Werf, who made a beautiful short movie about the research in my lab. And after its premiere here in Nijmegen, it has been shown in science film festivals in New York, Paris, and Abu Dhabi. And I think that is fantastic, because although I think science is intrinsically valuable, I do not at all mean with this that scientists should sit in their ivory tower and be left alone. I think it is great that we live in a world where there is a constant dialogue between science and society, so that we can and should explain the value of fundamental science. A final thought related to this topic. Why are we then actually curious about how our brain works? Why are we curious about things that sometimes don't have any obvious benefit to us? such as knowing about the origins of life or the functioning of the brain. This is something that I am increasingly interested in, and this will be one of the future avenues of research in my lab, in collaboration with the lab of Roshan Kohls. And unlike this quote from Alice in Wonderland, that curiosity often leads to trouble, our hypothesis is that just as we have a drive for food, we also have a drive for information in order to create the best possible predictive model of the world. Therefore, we constantly seek out the unexpected, try to find things that surprise us. Because surprise is what you could say the gateway to better models. It allows us to update them and to learn new things. Having a good predictive model of something allows you to control it. If you don't understand how something works, you can't control it as some people who have a VCR probably know. So therefore, I think curiosity is an exceptionally useful trait and definitely not something that gets you in trouble. Now, in the last couple of slides, I wanted to mention a few individuals who have been instrumental in my scientific life from my first baby steps to where I am now. And I cannot mention everyone, as the rector told me that this would not make for a very exciting lecture. So I hope you will be understanding about this. I started crawling in the world of science in, 2000, in 2001, when I was doing my clinical and research internship at the University Hospital Ghent in Belgium, as the rector already alluded to. And it was here that I became really interested in cognitive neuroscience, thanks to the inspiring time in the neuropsychological laboratory of Professor Vingehoots. This is where I had my first research experience with fMRI, one of the main workhorses to study the human brain in action. His creativity and can-do attitude helped me to discover the field that I'm currently working in, and I'm therefore really grateful to him for his inspiration. I learned to crawl in Ghent. Back in Nijmegen, I made my first steps in the lab of Peter Haggard as a research assistant in the MPI Nijmegen. And this was at a time when the Donners Institute was just being formed, and it was an exciting time. And I am very grateful for the opportunities provided and the guidance by Peter Haggard. Peter has been an excellent mentor over the years, and without him, the amazing institute at which many of us here work would simply not have been possible. Now, I carried out my PhD research in the lab of Ivan Toni at the Donners Institute, and doing my research in his lab was an extremely enjoyable experience. Ivan was interested in almost everything, 
and, more remarkably, had knowledge about almost everything. He encouraged me to explore my interests in many different directions, looking at brain structure and function, health and disease, and employing various research methods. And I'm still impressed by his ability to reflect on all these things with great sophistication. After my PhD, I moved from the Donders Institute to Neurospin in Paris, located in this beautiful building uh, that you can see over there. And during this period, I thought long and hard about what questions fascinated me most in cognitive neuroscience. And Stanislas de Hane, who is for me a bit like a modern age Leonardo da Vinci, was very helpful in thinking along with me. And it was in Paris where I defined the research themes that I talked to you about today. Now, after my postdoc, I had the incredible opportunity to start my own lab at the Donders Institute. Therefore, I could also start my own academic family. And Peter Koch, who is also here today, and Anna Todorovic were the two first members of this family. And I, was, I think I was incredibly lucky to have started my lab with such gifted students. Fortunately, my luck didn't end there. This family has steadily grown uh, to the situation you can see uh, here today. And as I said, I cannot individually thank all the researchers who I have worked with in the past years, but I am no less grateful to all of you. And this also holds true for all the people that form the heartbeat of the Donners Institute and continue to improve it. Tildy, Berend, Erik, Paul, Marek, Ize, Lucia, and many others, thank you all for your positive energy. Now, a last word of thanks goes to my family. I, for starters, am very thankful for my parents. They have been an enormous support throughout my life, approving of all the decisions I made, no matter how erratic they were, such as studying chemical engineering. Uh, their continuous support is even physically present here in the form of the gown that I'm wearing, which is a gift of my parents. Dasha, who thinks the intestines are more beautiful than the human brain, thank you for all your support you have given me and your belief in me. It's been wonderful being on this journey together with you. Finally, Sophie and Jacob, who were unfortunately too busy to attend today's lecture, <laughs> they also deserve a thank you. Scientists tend to get a little bit monomanic, and Sophie and Jacob are excellent at refocusing my attention to more important activities, like playing with dinosaurs or dancing. Ceci n'est pas une pipe. This, however, is a pipe. And it is truly amazing that you are all able to perceive it so quickly, thanks to the wonderful predictive brain inside your head. I thank you for your attention. Professor De Lange, dank u, voor, dank u voor uw boeiende presentatie. Ik wou nog even teruggaan naar de uh, tweede dia. En daarop stond dat u geen uh, professor bent. Als we dat nu als een nulhypothese zien in ons wetenschappelijk uh, jargon, dan zou ik die nulhypothese graag willen verwerpen na uw uh, uh, voordracht. Want u bent natuurlijk wel een hoogleraar, een typische hoogleraar. Want u kunt heel helder en boeiend over uw vakgebied uh, vertellen. Um, en... Uh, zo weet ik inmiddels ook dat IJslanders een heel typisch gevoel voor humor hebben. <lacht> um, ja, dat is dan bijna het eind van deze uh, bijeenkomst. Uh, de, we gaan zo direct naar beneden. U recepieert daar samen met mevrouw Osipoza, Osipova sorry, in de Anton van Tuinkerkenzaal. De uh, familie kan zich zo direct achter het cortège uh, stellen. En dat betekent dat we nu deze bijeenkomst afsluiten met gebed. Gratias tibi agimus omnipotens deus pro omnibus beneficius tuis qui vivis et regnas per omnia secula seculorum. Dank u wel. <tie>